<clears throat> in all of the uh, events of Jesus' life that are recounted for us in the gospel reading, in the gospels, in the New Testament, very few of them appear in all four gospels. It's rare that an event in Jesus' uh, earthly ministry is repeated in all of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Some have certain events, some have others, some share and others don't. In fact, if you take uh, the passion narrative, uh, so Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, the, the Last Supper, his uh, betrayal, his agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, his arrest, his, the terrible injustice of a mock trial that he undergoes, and eventually uh, he, Peter's denial, Jesus' crucifixion, death, and resurrection. If you take all of that as one event, which I think is, is really the right way to look at it, if you take all of that as one event, then in fact, there are only seven events in Jesus' life that are recounted in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And one of those events is the event that we had read just now by Dorothy. Jesus going into the temple, making a whip of cords, and driving out all those who are selling doves, sheep, and cattle, and pouring out the coins of the money changers and overturning their tables. It's one of only seven events that is told in all four uh, gospel readings. And I think this means that we're supposed to understand that it's an important story, not that the others aren't, but this is a crucial, critical story for understanding the nature of who Jesus is was and particularly of what it was that Jesus came to do. And that's especially the case in John's gospel. Because John's gospel, his account, John's account of this driving out of the sheep, the goats, and the cattle, and the overturning of the money changers' tables, John's account of this event is unique in one way, particularly. All three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have this event occur after Jesus' final entry into Jerusalem. So it comes just before uh, Jesus goes into the upper room to share a final meal with his friends, just before his betrayal, just before his agony in the Garden of Gethsemane and his arrest, trial, and execution. But in John's Gospel, this event occurs at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. It's in John chapter 2. And this, is, <laughs> this has led to all kinds of tortured arguments among scholars about whether Jesus did this twice. And once at the beginning and once near the end of his ministry, or whether it was just one event told, put in different places by the gospel writers. I don't think that's a terribly important question. I think the more important question is to ask ourselves, why would John locate this story at the very beginning of his gospel reading, of his gospel writing? And I think the answer to that is because it indicates something absolutely crucial about what it was that Jesus came to do and what it is that Jesus thought his ministry was going to be about. And in fact, his disciples, curiously, at this point, seem to have at least partially understood what it was that Jesus was doing in this action. John tells us in chapter 17, his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house 
or for the temple will consume me. What you have in this story, it's often cited as an example of Jesus getting really ticked off and angry and mad. I'm not, you know, I don't mind if Jesus got angry, but I'm not convinced that that in fact is what's going on here. What I think you're seeing in this story is Jesus' passion, his absolute commitment, his zeal for something. What his zeal is for in this case is for the house of God, for the temple. So what does that mean? What does it mean for Jesus to be zealous about the temple? I don't think it means that Jesus thought the paint was peeling on the outside of the building and they should do a better job of looking after their church. I don't think it meant upset that the carpets were fraying, which they are a little bit in here. Uh, I don't think it meant that he thought the windows weren't clean, which of course here they always are, thanks to Neil. I don't think it was actually about the physical structure. What we need to ask ourselves is, what was the purpose of the temple? What was the temple for? It's that, that Jesus was zealous about. Jesus was zealous for the purpose of the temple. And he's actually just told us in John's gospel, he's just indicated by his actions what the purpose of the temple was. John places this story <clears throat> near the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Very little has happened. One of the few things that has happened already is that Jesus has attended a wedding banquet. And at this wedding banquet, all of the guests are assembled. They're sharing in a feast. And the terrible news comes that the wine is about to run out. Mary, Jesus' mother, goes to him and says, look after this situation. What are we going to do? And Jesus instructs the servants at the banquet to take the six stone water jars that are there for the rites of purification and to fill them with water and take them to the steward of the banquet and serve some of the water. And when they do, they discover that the water has transformed into wine, but not just any wine. The story is very clear. It was the best wine, shockingly good wine. And that is a picture of you. It's a picture of the temple. Paul says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God? You are a temple. You are a stone water jar. And you are filled with the best wine. That is the truth of your nature. That is who you are. That is the essence of your dignity, of your beauty as a human being. No matter what your stone water jar looks like. No matter how shabby your temple may be. No matter how effective or useful or absolutely splendid your temple or stone water jar is you contain within you the beauty, the truth, the light, the strength, and the goodness of the God in whose image you were created. The temple, the, this church that I'm sitting in, and none of you are here this morning, this building, that's what it exists for. It exists to 
remind us. It exists to open us to the possibility that we are, as Paul said, temples of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. That we are the repositories of God's truth, of God's light and beauty and goodness. We gather here in this place Sunday by Sunday when we used to be able to, and hopefully, God willing, one day will again. We come here for the sole purpose of experiencing a heart opening that opens us to the deep truth of our nature, of who we are as creatures, as beings created in the image of God. And you see, the problem, the problem that Jesus encountered when he came, is that the temple, or those who operated the temple, had forgotten their true function. They had forgotten their purpose. Instead of being a place for heart opening, instead of being a place to come and discover the gentleness and the movement of God's spirit in our lives, the temple had become a self-serving system of benefit for those in power. The temple was serving the merchants and the merchants were serving me, the priests. You pay the merchant, the merchant pays me. There's a terrible, terrible account of this horrifying reality in the early scriptures, in the early Hebrew scriptures in 1 Samuel chapter 2 where Israel is going through a time of, of terrible uh, religious demise. The temple system is crumbling and the priesthood has become corrupt. And Eli, the head priest, seems to be unable to do anything about it, partly because it's his family, his sons in fact, who are most benefiting from the corruption of our own religious system. Samuel says, now the sons of Eli, the priest, were scoundrels. They had no regard for the Lord or for the duties of the priests to the people. When anyone offered sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand and he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot and all that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. See, that's the problem. That's when religion goes terribly bad, is when the priest is there to take for himself what he wants before the people receive anything. When religion exists to serve the priesthood, the priesthood is sick and the tables need to be turned over. The cattle need to be driven out. The money changers need to be upset. I had a conversation a while ago with a friend of mine who's a priest, not of this diocese, far away from here. And I was asking him how he was doing and how his church was doing in COVID, in these COVID days. And he said, it's very hard. And then he said something that struck me as really honest, but also really troubling. He went on to say, you know, what I really miss is I miss the adrenaline rush of standing up in front of a congregation 
full of people who are singing and saying prayers out loud and sharing in fellowship. He said, I really miss that feeling of adrenaline that I used to get from that gathering. And that, that cut me to the heart. I think it's very true, but I think it's terribly, terribly dangerous. It's dangerous that I, or any priest or any religious leader starts serving themselves and their feel, feeling of need, their desires, their longings, rather than serving the purpose of the church, which is heart of the The purpose of the temple, which is softening and opening to the reality and the love of God that is the foundation of our lives. When that happens, then Jesus comes storming in and turns the tables over. And you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe COVID is one of those things that's being used in the church to turn over some tables, to drive out some cattle, to upset some money changers, to call the priesthood back to an awareness of what it is we exist for and why it is God has called us to this thing called church. Because it's not about meeting my needs. It's not even actually fundamentally about, I'm sorry, but it's not even actually fundamentally about meeting your needs. It's fundamentally about calling all of us to recognizing the miracle that we are Jesus says, near the end of this story, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. And the religious leaders go crazy. What is he talking about? This can't be. It's taken 46 years to build this temple. What is he saying? And then John explains. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. John points forward to the resurrection. John points forward to that when life had done the worst thing it could do to Jesus, it couldn't stop the life force that was in him. When life had caused Jesus to be denied, betrayed, arrested, beaten, abused with a mockery of justice. When life had caused Jesus to soften, ag suffer an agonizing death and to be deserted by everyone around him. When life had caused Jesus to be mocked and ridiculed. And life had caused Jesus to feel utterly forsaken, crying out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsake me? When all that had been done to Jesus, it wasn't enough to stop the life force, the truth that was in him. That is what this story wants us to see. That there is in us a power, resilience that transcends all the trials, all the difficulties, and all the shocks. I know people are struggling in COVID. I know it's hard to be cut off from loved ones. I know it's hard not to be able to travel and go to beautiful places or to see family members who are far away. It's painful. But there's something stronger in all of us than that loss. There's something greater in every one of us than any loss. And these losses are all intended simply to call us back to an awareness of that reality, to call us to break open our hearts, allow our hearts to break open to the truth that resides within us so that we might see the indomitable power of life, the unshakable presence of the Spirit 
dwelling within us. We are not alone, We're not being forsaken. And whenever, whenever a priest or a religious system becomes an obstacle to that awareness, then it's your job to kick over some tables, to drive out some cattle, and to expunge from our midst anything that ever puts an obstacle in the way of anyone to finding that heart, heart opening place in their lives. And it's so beautiful that this text is what we we're reading this morning when, I mean, it's such a tiny thing, but it, it's, a, it's an important symbol that the community came together this week and figured out that we could put closed captioning on our Zoom church. And all of a sudden, if you need them, you can see words printed at the bottom of your screen and you can hear or see and read everything that's being written. And what that's an attempt to do is to turn over a table, to remove an obstacle that may have been hindering someone from coming to that place that the temple calls us to, that place of softening and opening, the indomitable presence, power, peace, and goodness that is the good wine of your true nature. Amen. Amen.